what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, uh, like the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of, uh, founder of P90X, Tony Horton. I like hearing, you know, David, the challenge stories. You know, he made money as a street mime um, before selling hundreds of millions of dollars. So he put his hat on the street, do a street mime thing, and that's how he made food and and rent money. Um, Baby Einstein founder Julie Clark talks about growing... um, uh, her company to twenty million dollars with five employees and selling it to Disney, um, but she beat cancer twice, and that was you know really tough. And how she did that. Atari founder Nolan Bushnell talks about when he was Steve Jobs' mentor. Steve offered him thirty three percent of Apple for fifty thousand dollars, and why he actually said no to that. So um, it's crazy stuff. Uh, and we'll hear David's story today. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise Twenty Five, which I co-founded with a business partner, John Corcoran. Uh, we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 clients and referral partners. And we do that by helping you run your podcast so it generates ROI. David has a podcast, which every, in my opinion, every business should have a podcast. Um, and I was actually inspired to start podcasting by my grandfather, um, who was a Holocaust survivor. And him and his brother were con- in concentration camps and were the only, in Nazi Germany, were the only people to survive. And the Holocaust Foundation actually did an interview with my grandfather, and he's not alive anymore, but his legacy lives on, inspiredinsider.com, on the My About page. You can watch it. I watch it multiple times a year. It really uh, makes me have a lot of gratitude and appreciation for life and what I have. Um, But So podcasting, yes, will help your business, but it also helps you and your guests leave a legacy of knowledge beyond... Um, ourselves. So as I do credit the single best thing I've done for my business and my life outside of my wife, um, if you have questions about podcasting, you know, email us, uh, support at rise25media.com or go to rise25.com and learn more. Um, Some of our clients include a Berkshire Hathaway company, a Harvard alumni group, SaaS companies. Um, And so I'm going to introduce today's guest, David, and he can tell the benefits of podcasting because he has one. You should check his out also. I've listened to it. It's really good. I mean, I was listening to one uh, this morning, David, of the um, he, the guest you had on um, got fired from McDonald's. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And actually went on to found a company before high school, for high school or before college, sold it for, you know, sold it for multiple yeah. seven figures. Um, and then found another company and amazing story. Um, so today, let me properly introduce you, uh, David. David Delaney is founder and CEO of Tenbound. And Tenbound, if you haven't heard of it, definitely check it out. It's, it's T-E-N, not the number 10, but T-E-N-Bound.com. Um, it's a research and advisory firm focused and dedicated 100% to sales development, performance, and improvement. I mean, I always picture the lifeblood of a company is sales. Like, how do you solve a problem in a company? More sales. Maybe not true, but salespeople definitely, that's, they, you know, default to that. I love their tagline, more appointments, more pipeline, more sales. Um, and Tenbound provides cutting edge research, high quality events, consulting, training, coaching uh, for all levels of a sales development team. And, and David, I don't know if it's a tough, you'll, you'll tell me a little bit if this is tough or not, but he sold training, sales training to salespeople. Okay. Um, sure. He's someone you want on your side also because he's an Eagle Scout. So he's probably prepared for every possible situation. David, thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you. I, I'm honored and, and blessed. Uh, there's so many things I want to talk to you about after that <laughs> intro. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate Start it. Start with selling sales training to salespeople. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cause you, yeah. before you started your own company, um, you worked, you know, you've start, help people start sales teams at Glassdoor and, um, and you've worked, you know, in it, it achieve global, which was acquired by, by Miller Hyman group. So start by when, you know, when you were selling sales training to salespeople, talk about those days for a second. 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there was a, a company called Achieve Global, like you said, it, it, it since was acquired. Um, and they uh, t- took over the training curriculum from Xerox, uh, which is going way back. Uh, we're in the <laughs> way back machine. But uh, Xerox had been known as the best in-house training program, you know, mm. in the technology space for years. And eventually they, they spun out this uh, pr- process to a private company. And um, I was lucky enough, I literally kind of stumbled into sales as many of us do, and was lucky enough to get in this company where we could actually take the sales training that we were selling. We had to in order to be able to talk about it. You think and, of it, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> right? And so, um, you know, I got the, a great sales education. And um, yeah, I mean, the prospects and the customers were tough. I mean, selling to salespeople is tough because they're focused on making their own number and they don't want to deal with anybody that's uh, not uh, completely adding value quickly to what they're doing, right? So it was a it was trial by fire for sure. I could see both sides. I could see it being harder, but also easier. They're already bought in. They already know the value of it. What What did yeah. you find when you were on those calls or in front of people? Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing is that you have to walk the talk and and be a, a living, breathing demonstration of the sales training that you're actually selling. Um, and so that's tricky because you know, you are the actual product to some extent if you're selling sales training. So they want to know that you prospect correctly, that you're engaging them correctly, you're doing your deep dive, you're getting the information um, that you need in order to make Mm -hmm. a solution. And if you miss a step or something goes wrong, then, you know, obviously your training doesn't work. So I'll see you later. So I remember, you know, there was, I've worked there for about seven years and there was a lot of, uh, learning experiences in just having to demonstrate what you're actually selling, you know? What were some of the big nuggets, takeaways you remember from that sales training that maybe you still use or maybe still teach, but that definitely helped you in that position itself? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's kind of like, um, you know, if you listen to a, a modern day, you know, guru, a lot of the stuff that they're getting is like 2,500 years old, you know, that they, they, they picked up. Yeah. Or I mean, I used to listen that. in my car, audio cassette tapes of Zig Ziglar, Jim yes. Rohn, Dennis Waitley, right. all, Tony Robbins, all those, those people. I know that you're a fan yeah. of Jim Rohn, among Big others. Time. So, yeah. Big time. And, and, you know, he got all of his stuff from, the Stoics and, you know, they got all their stuff from somebody else. So, so the reason I bring that up is, um, you know, as I have moved through my career, it's been over 10 years now since I was selling sales training um, or more than that, actually, um, you know, you see the same fundamentals come up in the new latest gizmos and gadgets and services and stuff mm-hmm, like that mm-hmm. and you, you just start to see patterns it probably has something to do with just getting old and being able to see yeah see doing patterns, so many right? reps you start seeing patterns totally you start seeing patterns and so it's kind of like oh you know there's there's new packaging and there's new ways yeah. to present ideas but it, it it's a lot of it goes back to those fundamentals and so you know, just being able to learn the fundamentals at an early part of your career has been super beneficial. What do you consider yeah. some of the fundamentals? What are the fundamentals? I mean, you know, if somebody um, has a pain uh, that you can potentially solve, you're going to have a way better time trying to sell them something. And so it's all about trying to do as much discovery to be able to dig out that pain and be able to describe how your product or service could help with that. And so if you take it back from there, you first have to have some kind of relationship, you know, in order to put them in a situation where they'll give up the information that you need in the discovery period. And then taking it back even further and what we've been working on at TenBound is like, how do you initiate that relationship in a way, you know, in a world that's so crazy right now as far as attention spans um but but yeah it, it's fundamentals you've got to be able to dig out the pain points that that they're uh focused on right now and trying to solve connect that to your product build a relationship and then you got to be able to get in yeah. front of them initially 
What I love about what you said is nothing to do with the, even the selling process at that point. It's, right. you know, it's, it's almost just how do you get attention? Like initiating a relationship, forming a relationship, and then figuring out if you, you know, discovering their pain so that you see, do I have a solution for what your pain is? Um, yeah. From the initiating relationship, what have you found? There's always things that people are doing. What is a good way to initiate a relationship without you know, coming across, you know, I guess adding value to someone. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the million dollar question right there, yeah. you know, um, because, um, and, and it's interesting because just fast forwarding, I, I had always wanted to get into technology and, and, um, you know, being in the Bay area. So when I, when I left the sales training company, I, I w got into the tech space and the way that they were forming their sales team and their go-to-market teams was they would have the marketing engine, you know, the inbound engine, and then they would have a layer between called sales development, and they call them BDRs and SDRs, and that team, which would sort of process the initial inbound marketing into appointments, and then they go outbound and do the, the cold calling and things like that. They would then hand those appointments to the sales reps so that they could spend more time, you know, honing. They're their more qualified. Program. Exactly. By the yeah. time and they get to the sales reps. Exactly. Okay. And so, and so, and you know, just to fast forward to today, that's what we really focus on. How do you perfect that, that sales development part of the, the funnel? And, um, I, I think that, you know, companies that, um, are just reliant on the inbound marketing and, and hoping that they get enough leads um, and then being able to hand those directly to the salespeople, um, you're, you're losing a, a big part of the potential uh, pipeline that you could have. Because, uh, you know, to your question, you've got to have somebody kind of in between there personalizing things for the, the, either the people who reach out or if you're cold calling. And because that personalization is the, the work that it takes to have a relevant conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. So it's not just spam, you know, and it's, it's not just a generic message. It's, I, I know, I get you. Um, I understand, you know, your world to some extent and some of your pain points. And that's why I'm reaching out instead of just, you know, essentially Blanket messaging. a billboard. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So biggest mistakes people make, um, would you say some may be not having that layer? Um, at what point should you, should a company, is it the right size to add that layer in if they don't already have it? Because they may be thinking, David, that sounds great. You know, we don't even have that. I don't know if a lot of the companies come to you, they don't have that at all, or they just want to improve that layer. Um, at what point should someone add that layer into the you know, SDR, BDR, the sales development person into their, their company? Yeah, definitely. So it, it, like you said, it all depends on the size of the company and really um, the industry too. So the SDR layer is a standard practice in software as a service. Um, we're based in San Francisco. Um, I don't travel much because a lot of our work is right here in San Francisco because literally most most of the uh, SaaS companies have this layer, so they yeah. need help to to perfect that. Um, but you know, beyond that, because well, Glassdoor, right? You put the systems in place there, pretty much, right? We did. I mean, that was back in the day. There was a seminal work that came out called uh, Pro uh, Predictable Revenue uh, by a guy named Aaron Ross, yeah. and it's it's still very. He was worked for today. Salesforce, right? Or and he, he got came out of Salesforce, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So he had put it together at Salesforce, which is a SaaS company, um, and, uh, and uh, perfected that model and then ma made it into a book. And, um, you know, to your question, w now when someone spins up a, a SaaS product um, and they, they feel like they've got a good go-to-market uh, uh, fit uh, to be able to go out and sell it, um, you know, they'll usually hire an all-around salesperson, somebody who's doing the little bit of marketing, a little bit of sales development and closing deals, you know, get that going for a while, get some sales coming in, and then they hire another person for to be a full cycle sales and another person. And suddenly now you've got three people 
there's not much uh, pipeline coming in from just the marketing funnel at the top. And the three people are sitting there going, I was hired to sell and my calendar's empty and I'm not getting any leads. So then the, they go, oh, well, get on the phone, start prospecting, you know, <laughs> start cold calling. And the salespeople are just like, oh, great. You know, it's like the worst <laughs> thing because <laughs> it's not going to pay the bills. Um, you know, so that's when these companies start to go, okay, we read predictable revenue. We've been on 10 bound. Okay, we get it. Let's hire an SDR. Let's hire a BDR. They call them all different things. Let's hire someone whose main job is to fill up the calendar of those sales reps so that they're not spinning their wheels every day. Boom. And then it goes. So that's in a SaaS model. And so you go from, you know, one SDR at a smaller company to across the street here at Salesforce where they probably have about 150, you know, who are just in charge of setting those appointments. Now, if you get outside of our little Silicon Valley, NYC, you know, Austin, Denver bubble that we have of technology companies, they call them different things. You know, they call them inside sales. They call it telemarketing. They call it, you know, other things. But there, those other industries are just starting to see this machine that they could potentially put in place and uh, starting to, uh, you know, get into it. So it should be interesting to see how that do you do you you help people advise on hiring and training that layer sdrs bdrs those type of people what are some of the big mistakes with hiring them bringing them on oh god how much time do you got (laughs) no um so according to you 10 minutes okay or no 20 20 minutes (laughs) so um you know the 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 stereotypical hiring model is we're going to get a uh, person fresh out of college, uh, no experience, no sales experience, and um, you know, pay them half of the AE, the account executive salary, and have them get up to speed and start cranking out appointments. Um, you know, that, that model works uh, to some extent if you've got a great training program and you, you've you, you can spend like, a lot of time. Buy with Achieve that. Global. No. Right. <laughs> ten bound. <laughs> we have ten, ten bound. Right. Um, exactly. That's where ten bound have... comes in. Exactly. Right. The the next generation it. of Achieve Global. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but if you don't have time to spend all that time with them, you can't just stick them with the sales rep and say, "Here, you train them," because the sales rep wa- again wants to sell. They don't want to be training somebody all yeah. day, generally. And so, um, you know, big mistake is hire someone fresh out of college, stick them in front of a computer, give them a list of names, and go go for it. You know, good luck. So, a, a better a better way to do that is find somebody that has had some sales experience, can show you that they can you know, get on the phone, get rejected, you know, get beat up a little bit, has some grit and, um, and, and wants to break into your industry. Mm. Uh, You know, look at those resumes, give them a chance because sometimes those are the best uh, SDRs that you can get, even if they don't follow the exact uh, hiring model that's uh, stereotyped in Silicon Valley. You know, David, I love what you just said, grit, right? Yeah. So how do you find people with grit? What are some of the, maybe the positions you've discovered throughout the years that, oh, that maybe most people wouldn't think of because they didn't take the stereotypical path? Yeah. Well, one of the uh, worst kept secrets in SDR land is um, collegiate athletes or, hmm. you know, semi-pro amateur athletes who yeah. um, are looking to break in, you know, either to the tech industry or whatever, you know, kind of industry that you're in. A um, lot of grit there. They have to get up at 5 a.m. They've got to train themselves. They've got to, you know, follow a strict diet. So there's some great potential there. The question is, can they pivot that to sitting in front of a computer, sending emails and calling strangers all day? That's right. the key. The other thing is people that maybe have been super successful in other sales positions, but th- there's sales positions that don't make much money in. Door-to-door sales, mm-hmm. you know, cut co knives, college works painting. Um, and if they've got some kind of track record where they did really, really well in those high rejection, high stress positions, hey, you bring that grit to the tech industry, 
you could be making six figures within a couple of years with that same kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. So, so you look at those, those resumes, B to C, they worked at the sprint store, but you want to see, make sure that they have some kind of demonstrable, you know, track record. They have a trophy. They've been there for a few years. They got promoted, something like that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Uh, my sister worked in, uh, as a car salesman for like five years. And so I could see that being a ton of rejection, really tough, but it translates to, you know, one of the, you know, software tech, well, you know, she worked, then went on to work for Salesforce. So I guess that, that applies. Um, 100%. Yeah. Door to door. You're always taking a risk. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. Everybody's on their best behavior. You know, when they, this is just in general, the, the, you know, you got your, your nicest shirt, you're, you're looking great. You've got tons of energy. You're never really going to know until you know, three to six months into it. If they're. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask next is about red flags. Cause obviously they're salespeople. They're probably good at sales. They're pretty good. Even if they're pretty good, they sell you on hiring them. Right. So yeah. what, what's uh, maybe some of the red flags people should look out for. A huge red flag in the SDR world is um, coachability. You know, can they, can they listen? Can they put their ego aside? Listen, try some new mm. things, come back to you and let you know if you at least tried it. Um, and, you know, it's been a couple of years, but when I was running SDR teams and still, you know, when we're doing consulting and training, if somebody knows it all, they already know everything and you're trying to get them to get back on track, it's the worst. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's a huge red flag. So it, mm. hire for coachability is the mm. main thing beyond grit. I mean, I would say that that's one of the top two or three uh, attributes. Yeah. So some of your mentors or distant mentors, you mentioned Jim Rohn. What are some of the um, other resources or people that you followed throughout your career? Oh gosh. I mean, how much time you got? Yeah, not much. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would definitely check out if you're in the entrepreneurial space, if you haven't heard of Dan Sullivan, um, he runs strategic coach yeah, totally. up in Toronto. Um, it comes I mean, to Chicago too. Yeah. He comes. He, yeah. They, they've got programs. Um, I am just a fan, a huge fan of anything that comes out of that guy's mouth. Um, I'm new to entrepreneurship. Uh, I was in the corporate world for yeah. 20 years and uh, we started this and, um, you know, Dan Sullivan has been an amazing resource um, for me. Who else? Jim Rohn, Dan Sullivan. I'm Jim curious. Rohn, I got my yeah. audible cue is needs yeah. I have three credits in there. So I need some recommendations from you. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely get on the um, the Daily Stoic, um, you know, newsletter with Ryan Holiday, and pick up a few Ryan Holiday books. I read the Daily Stoic every day. Mm -hmm. It's been mm -hmm. a huge, mm. huge help in, um, you know, just like I said, 2,300 uh, year old philosophy that is as fresh and useful today as it was back then. Um, you know, to that extent too, someone who's really been um, influential, influential on me is a guy named Jocko Willink, who hmm, totally. I'm sure that your listeners are aware of, ex-Navy SEAL. I saw him speak at a conference a couple of years ago, bought a couple of his books. Um, you know, I, discipline and Talk focus. about grit, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, self-discipline, getting up in the morning, making your bed, yeah. you know, and all those things. Um, definitely something I need to work on. And in the entrepreneurial space, you don't have a boss. There's nobody breathing down your neck except for your customers and making them happy. But your customers are not going to be there at 630 in the morning and say, get your ass out of bed. Right. So you got to do it. And so his, his work has helped me to like, kind of kick my ass a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I had, um, Mark Devine on, um, uh, who's also, you know, ex Navy SEAL. He runs a huge facility in San Diego. Um, and, uh, he puts people through Kokoro, which is like a Navy SEAL hell week, like for civilians or Navy SEALs. And I know some people have gone through it. They said it's like, the, I, I was like, Oh, this sounds great doing the research for that interview. And then I saw someone I know who does Iron Man like no problem. And they're like, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I'm like, forget it. I don't know if this is for me. I'm out. Baby steps. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I know there's a, there's a guy named Wim Hof. That Wim Hof. I had in, Wim Hof on the show. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I was going to say, he's sitting in baths of uh, ice oh, cubes. I'm going, he is the ice man. He let is me the start ice with man. a cold shower there, Wim, yeah. and then I'll work up to that. <laughs> I've gone through his course, online course, actually. Uh, it's, it's remarkable stuff. So, yeah, check out that. Wim Hof, great suggestion. Um, awesome. People like to geek out about tech, I'm sure. Like, what tools do I use? I'm sure you get this question all the time. And I'm, I am curious on your thoughts and it, it could be, you could name multiple for different, you know, aspects, whether it's calling or keeping track or, you know, there's a million different pieces of the funnel. I'm curious what comes to mind most for people's tech stacks that you see. Yeah, I mean, you can you you can definitely go crazy on this. Um, the, the you know the listeners might have seen there's a Martech five thousand. I think it's more than five thousand marketing tools. There's a sales. <laughs> I've not seen that. But go yeah, on. <laughs> there's one. There's one specific to sales technology. You know, all the way through the pipeline. And then we actually put together a niched one. Okay. That's only sales development. So cool. where should we know? see it? And that's over, uh, yeah, tenbound.com forward slash uh, market dash map, the market okay. map, or just go to tenbound.com research. Um, and the reason I bring that up is there's a whole tool set and service set that are focused on just that middle layer of the SDR that's amazing. And ADR world. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. I, it's it, it was more of just a passion project. I wanted to see how we could you know, organize this into something. And then our next step was, okay, we've got, you know, 300 companies on here. How do you organize this better? So we created a directory that, that each of the companies that are on there can fill in their directory, cool. give us your value prop, tell us how you're different and give us some case studies. Just boom, 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 super quick. And, um, you know, to your question, there's some fundamental tools and services that you need in sales development and then there's the full stack you know and it just depends if you're that company that has one sdr and you're trying to get some appointments for your sales team you probably can get away with um you know maybe a good recruiting agency or a sales education agency to give you the best person um, good data and then some kind of they call it sales engagement platform which is you know, key, it's the keeping everything on track for the SDR so they're not, you know, over there doing something off, off the reservation. So if you've, if you've got those basic fundamentals in place, then you're going to be pretty good to go for a while. Yeah. And, um, and then you want to start to, as you become more sophisticated, layer things on depending on where you see gaps in your process. Uh, but you really, data is, you got to have somebody doing the job, right? So you got to hire somebody. Step one. That's step one. <laughs> you need an operator. You know, even, yeah. even, if, I, even if I say, as I say that, um, you know, one of the biggest quadrants that we have there is the outsourced SDR industry, which continues to grow. And that's mm. basically, you know, you're a CEO and you're sitting there going, you know, I just want appointments. I don't want to hire these people. I don't want to train them. I don't want to do all this stuff. I just let want just money. Out, just hand just me money this. and I don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. They go, let me just, let me just outsource this. And there's just, every time we redo the market map, we find 10 other, 20 other companies that will. Yeah, uh, I see that. Outsource, outsource. services. You're, I can see you yeah. squeezing all of these things in. Yeah. Um, We're going to have to make another whole amazing. quadrant of this because, um, I think that it's a, uh, it's a growing thing, especially, you know, if companies are just like, Hey, look, I just want the result, man. I don't want to, I, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. I just want the result. I'll hire these. And, uh, you gotta be careful about that. Yeah. So go to 10 bound.com at the top navigation research. Yeah. It drops down to sales development market map. Click on that and you'll see the treasure trove of probably he's put this together over 16 years of being in the industry. Um, and you can see there, and, and you, you, there is a view directory. So you said that companies can go in there and actually add themselves to that directory. There's no cost or fee nope. for that? Nope. It's, um, it's okay. just, you know, um, the, a lot of the traffic that comes to TenBound is the SDRs and the SDR managers. Mm -hmm. And they're always looking for direction on what, what are the top tools. And yeah, that's awesome. 
So we're trying to make that available. Yeah. So when you look at that, I'll just give you, like you mentioned, there's communities, recruiting, voice over IP phone systems. You recommend marketing automation, sales enablement, mailings, um, and then all those other pieces. So it, sound, it looks like the, the left is kind of the fundamentals pieces. Um, and then as you, you can you know, decide, and there's a huge thing of outsourced services. Um, so if that, I'd have to blow this thing up to, uh, to read all of them. But, um, but I think it, it generally it's really cool just to see what pieces maybe people are missing or not using um, as a broad category you know, not just the specifics, you know, like, oh, team man, I don't have a team management software. I mean, not that people just, they just want to add software, <laughs> but, uh, but, but right. seriously, like there's a gamification, like, oh, that makes sense. I'm not gamifying enough. And they, I, I think just seeing the categories will give people ideas of what they should be doing with their team. A hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. And then, like you said, it's, it's what, what is the process that you're trying to put in place? And then where are the gaps that might potentially be filled by a product or service? Um, you know, where we see people get in trouble is they go the other way and they just sort of start plugging in all these different tools. And, and then next thing you know, the uh, person who's running the show leaves the company and nobody even knows the password, all these things. Yeah. And it's like, there's got to be a more strategic approach. And so hopefully that can help. What advice, I know it's going to vary. Do you give to people? I'm sure um, when, if they're asking you advice on outsourced, the outsourced services, like when to yeah. keep, keep it in house or maybe do a combination. Uh, maybe there's a, yeah. maybe there's a good use case that you've advised someone on. You don't have to name names on what you recommended to a specific company on combination of that. Yeah, it's interesting because we, we set out to answer that very question. We did a buyer survey of people who bought outsourced services and what was important to them and how they went down the, the different um, categories. And it's available. There's a free executive summary on there in the research section. But oh, cool. uh, the bottom line is, if you, if you look at it like a puzzle piece, um, there could be no pieces. That means you just don't even have an SDR program and you need a, one of those services to come in and, 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 and complete the picture so that you can get some appointments. Um, uh, in other situations, you've got some of the puzzle pieces. So you actually have an SDR, you've got some data, but there's, um, they're, they're having trouble um, personalizing the messaging. So you could plug in one of those companies to just help you to personalize the message, give it to your in-house person and make them more effective. You know, and, and there's a lot of different use cases in that regard where you don't want your in-house person doing everything. They just need some very specialized information for your industry that you could potentially outsource. Um, and so it just depends if you, if I would just recommend if you kind of whiteboard out your process and you see a huge gap that's bigger than what somebody can do in the office, you might want to look at some of those outsource companies and talk to them about how they could potentially help. So David, talk about the conferences a little bit. Absolutely. How did you get into the conference <laughs> business and, and what should people expect when they come to, um, and that's how someone, you know, on who listens to inspired insider. It's like, you got to check out what David's doing at 10 bound, the conferences, everything. And that's how I discovered what you're, what you're up to. So I'd love to hear oh, about that's the conferences. Amazing. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, we, when we started the company, um, you know, uh, we started doing meetups here in San Francisco of just the sales development managers and the reps could come and just started build that community because, um, you know, there wasn't anything necessarily focused on just that, that SDR world that, that I could find. And it, it kind of evolved into a conference here in San Francisco for, um, you know, back in 2017, when we started it, it was just managers, you know, if you're running these teams and trying to figure out how, how to uh, put those together, then we added a, a layer for the reps to come and do some training with their managers. And then we added a layer for revenue operations, which is kind of the person in the background doing all the plumbing, if you will, and keeping these things organized. So now we've got three tracks um, in the San Francisco conference, it's the bigger conference, and we're replicating the playbook out in New York City um, later in the uh, in the summer. 
just doing a leadership track. So it's the people out in NYC who are running these teams, the executives, or you know, they want to um, get into management of these teams, they can come to the one day conference out there. So if you can't tell already, like from my six hours of research or more and his website, there's a lot to check out at tenbound.com. So check it out. Um, my last question, two questions, David, and I totally appreciate your, your time and expertise because, you know, I'll, sales is a lot of times the lifeblood of a business. So not having all these pieces in place is, is detrimental, obviously. Um, so check it out. I always ask two questions. It's inspired insider one, what's been a low moment and how you push through challenging. And then on the flip side, what's been an especially proud moment, um, that you, you think about. Um, so, you know, an entrepreneur, the world's entrepreneurship sales, like you take a lot of hits, a lot of rejection. Um, what's been a low moment of how you push through? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because there's kind of two sides of the coin. So a low moment was, um, even back in my corporate days, I was working for a great company, great leadership, tons of potential, but it wasn't necessarily in the, the subject matter space that I was really into. So I left the company and went to a company that was in the subject matter. It was in the sales development you know, uh, area, but um, it didn't have all the great aspects of the company, <laughs> the other company. So I took a plunge, terrible experience, left, took another plunge, uh, again, working for somebody, horrible experience, left. And, you know, I was at a crossroads, completely broken, confused, didn't know what was going on. And, um, you know, was, uh, had to make some kind of change because I've got mouths to feed, right? <laughs> got, and, um, and started to pick up some consulting and training gigs and realize that I was, um, you know, had a valuable skill in being an expert in this sales development world. And, and so that was a low point that became a high point because mm. ever since I, I decided to burn the ships, right? And you, you know that expression, burn the ships, not going back to the corporate world. I'm going head first into entrepreneurship. We're going to start 10 bound and we're going to rock it. W once I made that decision, I have never been happier mm. in my career mm. and in my life. I mean, I feel different. I feel like, you know, the chemicals are running differently because, um, uh, I made that decision and, uh, um, you know, I mean, I'm not driving a gold plated Rolls Royce by any way. Even if you could, you may not be anyways. So. Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> so hopefully someday it'll pay off and be super lucrative financially, but just spiritually and, and, uh, you know, physically, um, it's just been an amazing experience. And so, you know, anybody out there who's going through something that's just, utter crap and feel like shit right now. Um, I would say hang in there. I mean, I know it's kind of a cliche, but hang in there, stay positive, take care of yourself because it could be the best thing that ever happened to you. I mean, sometimes um, there's comfort in knowing that's normal. Like we've all yeah. gone through that. You know what I mean? And yeah. if you haven't, I don't, I don't know anyone who hasn't really um, in yeah. some aspect. Um, on the flip side, what have you been especially proud of with, with Tenbound? Yeah, I mean the you know um, the the progress that we've made from a bootstrapped you know um, service based company to where we are today um, has just been amazing to see it grow and and to see it become successful. And the more companies that uh, get into sales development and and uh, start you know sales development programs beyond the tech industry, the more potential I see in it. So. Um, it's just, it's thrilling every day to be able to grow something from nothing. And, and, and that, that's just uh, been a high point for me. Yeah. David, I want to be the first one to thank you so much for your time. Everyone check out 10 bound.com that's spelled out T E N bound.com and, uh, check out what they have on their site. Thanks, David. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.